evening, everybody. Good. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you for coming to La Mama. Uh, before we get started, a few quick things. Please turn off your cell phones. Uh, the show, so you know, is an hour and a half with no intermission. In case of any kind of emergency, you can always exit out the way you came or across the stage, uh, up the stairs, and out onto Third Street. Um, all right, we're getting some laughs on that one. All right, so we're doing well. All right. Um, also, uh, we would uh, highly encourage all of you to uh, check out EncountersAlaska.org. There's a link you can find a uh, little information about in your program. And if anybody has their own uh, cross-cultural encounters that they would like to share, uh, there will be some people out in the lobby after the show in blue shirts, so please uh, approach them and, and talk to them. But anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you all so much, uh, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Welcome to this land. Today we walk in footsteps thousands of years old. Today we stand with my ancestors, the central Yupik people of Alaska. Today also we sit with the ancestors of this land, the Lenape people, traditional owners of this ground right here. We honor the presence of these ancestors, their imagination, their knowledge, and their spirits. I go
it seems to be coming closer and closer. We take it for the roar of a sea lion, but then we can see men. We had not expected to find human beings in this remoteness, but there they are. Two kayaks coming toward our ship, the St. Peter. As the men paddle closer, we can hear them chanting in a high-pitched voice, which we take to be a friendly incantation or a prayer of welcome, like those natives in our own wilderness in Kamchatka. We beckon them to come closer. They beckon us to approach the shore. We beckon, they beckon. Then they scoop up seawater while pointing to their mouths to indicate that we will have food and water if we go with them. Eventually, one of them comes on board. We welcome him with a cup of brandy, which, following our example, he gamely attempts to imbibe. But no sooner does the brandy touch his lips than he violently spits it back out again. And then he is on his way. This meeting, the one with the other, takes place on September 4th, 1741. My name is Vitus Jonasen Berry, commander of his Imperial Majesty's ship, the St. Peter. Soon there will be many more such encounters, but not for me. <laughs> Two months from now, death will ravage the St. Peter, marooned on an Arctic island, our bodies eaten by ravenous foxes. My own burial will begin before I die, the sea washing the sand over my wasted body and scurvy on my gums like a dark brown sponge. Henceforth, the place of my death shall be known as Bering Island. We have claimed this vast land for his imperial majesty, Tsar Ivan Antonovich, emperor autocrat of all the Russias. And I am the Russian Columbus. My name will forever be imprinted on this land. of broken river or sea ice that is trapped in a narrow channel. Permafrost. Permafrost is frozen rock, soil, or sediment that never thaws. In areas not capped by ice or glaciers, permafrost is topped with the active layer, hospitable ground that supports life. Fast ice. Shore fast ice, land fast ice, or fast is sea ice that is fastened to a shore. It may grow from seawater freezing or from thousands of ice pieces drifting, slowly drifting to shore. It does not move with current or wind. and loneliness are your two best friends. You seek out roots, you 
wrong thing. You're 21 years old, just out of college. You sign yourself up for a volunteer position at a social service radio station up north among the Eskimos. It'll be exotic, you think. A year off, you call it. Off the grid, off the plan, off the map. You'll be a news reporter. You'll serve the people, you say. Well, you'll collect some memories to take back with you. No, you'll serve the people. You pack two cumbersome suitcases, say goodbye to New York City, board long flights on several almost empty jets. You watch the great urban world trickle away behind you, highways like fading tendrils, cars like the last members of dying ant colonies, dutifully marching, gasping last breaths. Then, Verdant mountains give way to great brown plains, give way to black seas, give way to craggy peaks, falling away into impossible expanses of never-ending rolling treeless tundra, with rivers doubling back on themselves impossibly, and the rutted tracks of four-wheelers and snow machines replacing the lines of man-made urban roads. Then, suddenly, from beyond the rim of the earth, a little dusty toy city strung like a bauble along the Bering Sea coast, squat buildings with wide streets, one lone white steeple, white waves on a wide beach. This is Nome. Is this home? This is Nome. In those first August nights in Nome, the sun doesn't go down. You cover your bedroom window with aluminum foil, keeping the light out. Children outside play at 11.30 p.m., midnight, shouting and biking past your house in little happy gangs. You wake early each morning, still sunny, and stumble to work at the radio station. You serve the people. Well, you drink your coffee, but you serve the people. One evening, you go for a walk. A group of kids bikes past you, really close, early teens or preteens. They're shouting things and laughing. Gussuk! In Yupik language, white guy. No left me. Gussuk! Gussuk. Gussuk. No. Gussuk. Uh, uh, OK, white guy. <laughs> um, they're shouting and laughing, and, and you laugh too. You say hello to them. Hello! You want to be friendly, open. You're different. You're going to change things around here. They pass you again. This time, right on your shirt, your arm, your face. You find a tuft of grass and try to wipe this away. Try to wipe this away without touching it. Wipe. 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 Gussuk? Gussuk. In Russia, the Kochaks were a military tribe. They served on the ships of the first Russian explorers of Alaska. By the spirit, they were expelled. The word Gussuk means free, independent, a nomad, a vagabond. Gussuk. In your village, the Sigluks, the teachers are the Gussuk. Growing up in Gasigluk, you mostly watch TV, PBS, Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock. <laughs> yeah, them guys, <laughs> Fraggle Rock. You are the channel changer. Wait, go change the channel. <laughs> After a long day of chasing caribou with your uncles, you just want to see free that stream. The first white people you ever see were on that stream. And in Gasigluk, the first Gasak you know is a man named Bill, <laughs> principal of the school. Principal Bill. He's skinny and taller than everyone. You're afraid of him until he talked to you. He talked with your family. He became a friend. Time passed. 
thing. One year, one day, still leaves the village. It's spring, and the ice on the river is time. Break up time. Phil packs up his teacher house and flies away like most gushups do. But Phil knew this place. He loves it. Sometimes you wonder if he knows it better than you do. The people gave him a Yupik name, Jarayak, meaning bear or monster. <laughs> driving a snow machine in late spring snow. Years have passed since that first summer in Nome. You're an Alaskan now. People call you that. You say it too. Today, you're following Mitchell, a teacher from the Midwest. He's made his whole life up here. He traps animals, tans the hides himself. He camps in the snow and pulls greasy spark plugs from broken down snow goes. He's a man you admire. You wonder how to be a man in the bush. Drive big machines, go barehanded in the cold, wear car hearts and hip waders, don't be too soft, and do everything on your own. Is that right? Is that how this works? Today, Mitchell's invited you out to the country. You have a borrowed snow go and a borrowed gun that you don't know how to shoot. <laughs> Today, says Mitchell, you're hunting fox. The world is white. White hills, white river, faint white orb of sun. The tundra is wide open, marked by smudges of brown willows. Every now and then, every now and then, the roar of the machines you ride scares up a ptarmigan, or two, or three. Mitchell says, let's go up to that next bunch of willows and see what we can see. Then a streak of brown red fur bolts into view, a fox. Mitchell says, there, you follow it. The fox leads you both into a wide expanse of snow. Mitchell gestures with his gun again. You go that way, his gun says, and I'll go this way. We'll cut off the fox before he makes it to the next stand of willows. Now you're tearing across the tundra alone. Mitchell peels away over the next low ridge. The fox is between the two of you. With an easy little squeeze of your thumb, your machine accelerates, roaring, closing in on the fox. What well, brought me to Alaska really was love and mountains. I got to hear all these stories of king crab and wild bars. And so I wanted to become the first woman to win the Yukon quest. Flying away, looking out the window and looking down at the village and looking at the mountains and being like, okay, this is home. How do I make it so that this can keep being home? Wow, this is the land of broken toys up here. And I fit in. Geese flying and the trees that turn to this in one of my letters, I told Mother it looked like leaves had all been dipped in gold and hung out to dry. When I do travel, I often think, I'm going back to Alaska. This unique, exotic place that is on anybody's bucket list. Yeah, a lot of them think it consists of cold, dark, and 
Sarah Palin, but you know what? <laughs> we don't want too many people here. And Hydra Lutris. And Hydra Lutris. And Hydra Lutris. The fur of this animal is not waterproof. No, no, no. It has no blubber, and yet it lives in absolutely frigid waters. How, you ask? The secret is its incredibly dense fur. The densest fur in the animal kingdom. One square inch of the skin of an hydrolutris has up to one million hairs. The human head has 100,000 hairs, so you can imagine. <laughs> when resting, it floats on its back with its head, paws, and webbed feet folded in on its torso. Now, you might be thinking, aww, but it isn't doing this to be cute. It's doing this to conserve the cuteness is just you. <laughs> Anthropomorphizing, like you always do. In order for the fur to repel water, an hydrolutris has to stay absolutely, impeccably, impossibly clean. So it spends a whole lot of its time grooming. Cleaning the fur, removing loose fur, uh, untangling knots in the fur, rubbing the fur to squeeze out water, and blowing air into the fur. Hydrolutris lives its entire life in the water. Do you want to know the common name of this animal? Oh, come on. You ought to know by now. <laughs> We discover a man on the sea ice. Anut muktanch to butchikum hailan. He's seal hunting. Maksasukto. He kneels on the ice to wait. Jistomikto ita halun. Suddenly he hears something under the ice. Ashko naktanch ni to chikumache. He listens. Nichugne. He listens again. Salit nichugne. Yes! It's the strange sound of a seal under ice. He waits. He waits for the seal to surface. He sees it popping up beyond the next ice floe. He shouts to get the seal's attention. The man picks up his gun. The seal surfaces again. And the man shoots. It's floating for a while. The man pulls the seal up onto the ice. One. out of its sheath and cuts the seal's throat to bleed it. He is a successful hunter. Now it's time to go home.
1865, the United States is no longer united. It's brother against brother. It's fratricide. We call it now the Civil War. Yes, yes, so very civil. During this terrible war, the great powers of Europe watch and wait, plotting their next move. But Russia remains a constant US ally. <laughs> Tsar Alexander II sends two fleets, uh, one to San Francisco and one to Washington, D.C. There's an ulterior motive, of course. The Russians are trying to unload their hunk of land that's like an icebox, the unprofitable self-freezing freezer known as Ruskaya Amerika. They want to sell Alaska. But who can they sell it to? To the French? To the British? To the Spaniards? And have them as neighbors just across the Bering Strait? <laughs> I don't think so. No, no, no. The U.S. seems like the lesser of the evils, really. Honestly. <laughs> and so, uh, Friday, March 30th, 1867, the Russian foreign minister, Edvard de Stuckel, is announced at the home of Secretary of State William Seward in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Secretary of State Seward, I have good news. I have Horosho Novosti. I have Vundova news. What is it, my dear de Stuckel? Ah, it thrills me to tell you your dream to buying Ruskaya America for the United States of America has come true. The Tsar has consented to the sale. It's true. It's all true. Tomorrow, I will come to your State Department, and we will enter into a treaty for the transfer of Ruskaya America. I can go on now, my dear Mr. Seward. Au revoir. Das svidaniya. See you later, alligator. <laughs> Excellent, wonderful, delighted. But wait, 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 wait. Why not draft the treaty tonight, my dear de Stekel? Why wait to do tomorrow what we can complete today? Because your department is closed, and my secretaries are scattered about town, gambling the night away, <laughs> drinking themselves under the table, dilly-dallying, and dally-dallying with <laughs> the ladies of the night. Uh, never mind that. If you can gather your legation before midnight, you will find me and my staff awaiting your arrival, open and ready for business. When it comes to business, my dear de Stuckel, we are always open. We Americans are nothing if not enterprising. <laughs> think, of, think of Sam Walton. <laughs> think of the Koch brothers. <laughs> think of Martha Stewart. Remember her? <laughs> but wait, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. By four o'clock the next morning, the treaty is embossed, signed, sealed, and delivered. Why are we buying Russian America? We're being bamboozled by the Russians. Seward's icebox, a polar bear garden, a sucked orange. The US Congress approves the purchase of Ruskaya America by one vote. The cost, $7.2 million, or two cents an acre. And while the Stuckel and Seward are busy swapping handshakes and pats on the back and cash under the table, the indigenous people of Alaska, whose ancestors have been around for more than 10,000 years, are never informed. Mm -hmm. But that's progress. <laughs>
soulless, creatures. soulless creatures. So the first missionary that came up here was a Swede. His name was Axel Carlson, and he, had, mm -hmm. he was a Swede that did some missional work in Russia. He went up on a ship going up from San Francisco, mm -hmm. up on the Alaskan coast, and he asked the captain of the boat, who are these you know, people living on the fur lines up in Alaska? And the captain said, you know, don't bother, they are soulless creatures. So Axel Carlson was like, good. He took a boat and he went ashore in Junolfleet and he established a mission station, which is the first mission station for the Covenant Church in America. Yeah, his Axel Carlson is buried here with his tombstones. And when he came, there were no Christians. When he left, there were no heathens. The experience that they had long ago, where they came in and they wanted to save everybody without like stepping in our shoes. They came out of their culture into our culture, bringing their culture. for Stanley Kubrick's seminal and unprecedentedly influential masterwork of Cold War cinema, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying About the Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Teller's plan is targeting the place where the sea breaks its back, Alaska. <laughs> so-called Cold War. What about fallout drifting across the Bering Strait? Uh, that's easy. We <laughs> will blow this up when the wind is blowing the other way. <laughs> Imagine the creation of a new deep water harbor from which the riches of northern Alaska can be exploited. This will be called Project Chariot. legislative leaders and the press take the bait. The Fairbanks Daily News Miner declares, the holding of a huge blast in Alaska will be a fitting overture for the new era that is dawning in our state. This could be the greatest achievement of the century. This vital project will hold incalculable benefits for all mankind. Meanwhile, the firecracker boys fail to get in touch with the people most likely to be impacted by Project Chariot, the Inupiaq people at Point Hope, 35 miles away. Point Hope is the oldest continuously inhabited community in North America, and Teller has a plan for the village. <laughs>
a small bird that lives on tundra or cold upland areas. It is a favorite food throughout the state. Ptarmigan is often referred to as the chicken of Alaska. Angoon. Angoon is a Tlingit village that was bombed and burned by the U.S. Navy in 1882 due to a misunderstanding. The people nearly starved to death when winter came. There was never any compensation for the misunderstanding. In 1982, 100 years later, the U.S. Navy sent a letter to acknowledge what had happened. Lichen. Lichen are composite organisms. They have no roots. Lichen live on air, water, sunlight, and minerals in their environment. Lichen are the ideal organisms for capturing radioactive fallout. Caribou eat lichen. People eat caribou. serve the people. That's what everyone tells you. You do your work and make some money, capturing the story in village after village, gathering sound bites, taking them with you. The Nupiak people, Yupik people, Tlingit, Sukpiak, Athabascan people. You know how to say words now in those languages. Does that make this place yours now? Now you can claim it? Now? You can say that you belong here now. Waka Chamai, Koyana Iguayakwan, Alapa, that means cold. Adi, that means something like, oh my goodness. Gunashchish, thank you. Pihua, goodbye. Travel, motion, arrivals, boat, snow machine, truck. Airplane, tundra, mountains, rivers, oceans, collect them all, bag tags and airport codes, Tanuna, Eek, Kodiak, Manly Hot Springs, Angoon, Kivalina, Kasigluk. Kasigluk is a place where three rivers meet, flat tundra all around, and a little bluff where the newer part of the village is. The old side is sinking, sinking into the rivers. Wooden boardwalks are everywhere, and in springtime, everywhere there's mud. On the new side of the village, there's a post office, an airport, a store, 101 houses, 560 people. There are no roads out. In the village, it's hard to get jobs, hard to make money. Sometimes you sell your own things to get what you need. Once you sold a gun to buy some diapers. When you shop at the local store, everything is expensive. $12 for a jar of mayonnaise. It's better to go out hunting, but hunting and fishing is messy nowadays. Subsistence versus commercial, state versus federal, urban versus rural, non-natives versus native, and it's native versus native sometimes too. Uksumi, isu tukut, tum tupan kangkeleksu, upnek kami, kaya ngusoluta, pugiwnek, ojek kagnek, langinek. Gagmi, ik fagaluta, kuvialuta tu, kuspo fagmi, uksormi, tun tuak tuluta. Your first catch, you're 15 years old, you see something big and brown on the riverbank, tun tuak, a moose. Then you wait for your uncle to shoot it himself. Then he says to you, Nutiguluku! Shoot it! Your heart is pounding. The moose sees you, you see the moose. Ampe! Nutigaloku! Hurry up! Shoot it! It falls. 
Maybe you say a little prayer like you always do. That you use it well. And you get home safely. Then your uncle watching you. Maybe he's thinking, good job, Ubay Yuilmo. That's your Yupik name, Ubay Yuilmo. You got it from someone who just died when you were born. His spirit lives in you. That's your tradition. Ubay Yuilmo means to be still. Never go nowhere. Stay right here. Gasinia. Survivors, salvage what's left of the ship and the smaller one. <laughs> they find a small animal cavorting on the shore and in the water. And Hydromuchus, utterly adorable, <laughs> rumping, floating, and cracking muscles on its belly. You know, you might say it again. Aw! <laughs> Perhaps the Rusics think the same thing, too. But then what do they do? Well, they murder them, of course. <laughs> By the time they get back to Mother Russia, the ship is piled high. With 900 sea otter heads. And Hydromuchus becomes known as Soft Gold. Nyate Zolota. That's funny. Nyate Zolota. The Chinese aristocracy, the Mandarins, are mad. They are mad about sea otter furs. They'll pay any price for the pelt. Oh, it, just like they'll do a few centuries later with African ivory. <laughs> the Russian fur trade in Alaska. To meet all of the money-making demands, the Russians enslave the Alleys people, who are masters of sea otter hunting. The Alleys do the work, the Russians make the money, and they repay the Alleys with torture, murder, and catastrophic epidemics. <laughs> By 1911, the Spanish, the French, and the British join the squabble. Oh, and the Americans. That's us. The sea otter population drops from 300,000 to to less than 80,000. The sea otter, which used to live on land as well as in the sea, changes its way of life. Now it lives its entire life in the water. We did that. We changed the behavior of an animal. That's progress. Kindergarten teacher goes by Minnie. He likes you. 
one year she asks to introduce you by your Yuktik name, you tell her, no one's given me one. You've always wished for a Yuktik name. Her students try to choose one for you. Tuntrak! Kanaklak! Nata! Many laughs. No, she says, not moose, not muskrat, not she fish. <laughs> the next day, she comes to you. It means story man. Huh. Kulirin. The next morning you pull on your bunny boots for an early walk in the winter blackness. <coughs> Suddenly, several houses away, a door slams. A scream. You can see a figure on this same boardwalk, swaying, shadowy in orange lamplight. Then, from the house, Fuck you! I hate you! Fuck you! Can you do something? Can you run away? Uh, can you call someone? In the village, who is there to call? Your shadow turns to face you with his crown royal breath and stumbles. Hi, you say. I'm. I'm Kulirin. <coughs> Your what? forces his way back into the house, and you're alone. Story Man? This name from this place. This badge you can pick up and try on. You can wear it. You said it. You won't use that name again. You have that choice. November 1938. Nazis in Germany are torching synagogues, vandalizing Jewish homes and schools, and destroying Jewish businesses. In Europe and the US, people are asking how they can help the Jews. Here is a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt from a Jewish American citizen. Permit me to suggest there exists a place of refuge for the Jewish people so definite, so obvious, I am thrilled even to think of it. That asylum, that wonderful new promised land is Alaska. <laughs> Alaska, a territory that can be a state, a state that can and may it be, the brightest star in the firmament of states. Between 1938 and 1940, a proposal to resettle Jewish refugees in the United States is brought before Congress. President Roosevelt tries to ease restrictions on European Jewish immigration, but is thwarted by opposition from within and outside of Alaska. Most of the world will turn a blind eye, just like they'll do decades later during the Syrian refugee crisis. <laughs> thousands of Jewish immigrants coming, it would not be many years before Alaskan culture and economy were transferred from American hands to, to 
alien. It would be un-American. I'm against it. I'm against it. We're against it. It would be un-American. against which the action of the sea is directed. It is an ancient word of the Unungan people, called Aleuts by the Russians. In the mouths of Russian traders, the word Alukshka becomes Alaska, the place where the sea breaks its back. Agudak. Agudak, or Eskimo ice cream, is usually made with animal fat, freshly fallen snow or water, flaked whitefish, and any kind of berries whipped into a froth. Today, instead of animal fat, the usual ingredient is Crisco shortening. A Gouda isn't necessarily a... A Gouda! A Gouda isn't No, a Gouda! <laughs> um, Eskimo ice cream isn't necessarily a dessert. Air shock. Air shock. The powerful force of the scorching heat wave that immediately follows the detonation of a nuclear device. The Trans Alaska Oil Pipeline is supported by a repetitive, 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 repetitive series of metal sawhorses from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez, a distance of 800 miles. For the 800 miles of pipeline across the tundra vastness, the diameter of the pipes is 48 inches. Do you still live in an igloo? Igloo? Do you still live in an igloo? <laughs> when I was an exchange student to Connecticut from UAF, that was my first question all the time, and I got so tired of it. I would look at them, and I would say, yeah, my mom has a two-star igloo with an elevator in it. <laughs> they didn't believe me. <laughs> Until I started laughing. <laughs> and then the other question was, um, or talking about our native foods. Oh, those poor seals. And I said, what do you eat? Do you eat hamburgers? Yeah. Oh, those poor cows. <laughs> you can remember the Chukchi Sea Co. It's fall time in an island village, a hundred miles above the Arctic Circle. You're here to lead a school drama project. Like most villages, the school is the biggest building on the island. It's also the boarding house. Each night you curl up in a sleeping bag on the classroom floor. The school is perched right on the beach where the sea breaks on thawing permafrost. The village is eroding. The high school social studies classroom is the toughest. It's not the students. It's the teacher. Someone told you once, there are three types of Alaskan bush teachers. Missionaries, mercenaries, and misfits. <laughs> this teacher is a misfit. She's from the lower 48, like most, but she's bossy and mean. She has a PhD, and she tells the students and you to call her doctor. If she weren't here, things might be a little better. In your drama sessions, one student is always the first to volunteer, Daniel. After a movement activity, Daniel sits and sneaks a forbidden glance at his cell phone. <laughs> Doctor teacher pounces, she hauls Daniel from the room, he's hollering, your lesson is derailed, and Daniel gets suspended for a day? You can remember the next morning, the same classroom, struggling to keep students engaged, wishing Daniel could somehow come back if he were here. Things might be better. Suddenly, a student rushes through the doorway, shouting, Do you hear? They got beluga! They got beluga! 
somebody shot and harpooned the first beluga whale of the season. You stumble down the steep beach. There's a crowd gathered, and a woman with a clipboard ticking off the names of villagers as they step up with Ziplocs and plastic grocery bags. They're cutting up the whale, sharing each slab of blubber. Everybody gets a piece. Two teenagers are the providers today. One of them is Daniel, hero, successful hunter, good provider. Daniel's mother walks up to the school principal. You're standing just a step away. She says to the principal, Thank you. Thank you for suspending my son. Thank you for suspending my son. Casiglo. Casiglo is a dry village. That means no alcohol, no purchase, no possession, no sale. You grew up seeing it around you, your uncles and other people. At first, you're afraid of drunk until you tried it yourself. You started drinking lots. By the time you're a teenager, you and one of your friends go out and buy 750 milliliter bottle of liquor for $100 each bootleg. You can finish one bottle in 15 minutes. One day, you went to go visit your grandma when you were drunk. In her latuha, the porch, there's a freezer full of moose, caribou, Gatorade bottles of seal oil, and boxes of dry fish. Then she opens the door. She won't talk to you. She won't listen to you. She can smell it on you. Then you get so mad that you think that she doesn't love you anymore. So you go out and get another bottle. Another bottle. A couple times, you wake up in the Makewik, the steam bath. You wake up in the Makewik all cold, wet, covered in mud. People told you what you did when you were blacked out. You attempted suicide a couple of times. You didn't even know. And you thought to yourself, oh my God. You started up thinking about your kids, your family. That's why you tried to stop all of this has hurt you. It's still hurting you. It's hurting us. representatives of the Atomic Energy Commission and to ask questions about Project Ariel. Two reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders are whirling. The villagers are recording everything. Is this thing on? Oh, great. Um, thank you, Mr. Franklin, for your introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of of Point Hope. We have come here as representatives of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Now I want to emphasize and repeat. I want to emphasize and repeat. I want to emphasize and repeat that the commission has not yet approved any explosion. Now I hope that's perfectly clear. Now I hope that's perfectly clear. There will be no experiment unless it can be conducted safely. Now I hope that's perfectly clear. No one, no one will be hurt. No one, no one will be moved. Are there any questions? How long will it take for the fallout to decay? 
well, the radiation that will escape will be quite small. And the half-life of the radioactive elements will be so short that some will be gone in a matter of hours. Will the fish be safe to eat? Will the fish be safe to eat after it explodes it? Well, the fish in the Marshall Island test site were safe. What about the caribou? What about the caribou? Will the caribou hunt be effective? Oh, no, not at all. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let me explain. The detonation would occur outside of the normal caribou hunting season. Who is your radiation biology course with the AAC? That's Dr. Alan Seymour. Why isn't he here? Well, we didn't think it was necessary to pull him off the job. He's on right now. No, no, listen. All these people, all these people here, all these people are afraid of what this bomb will do. Internationally? No, here, here at Point Hope. What? I, I don't quite get what this question was. The effects of the blast. On your own people? Oh, well, I believe we've covered that already. I No, you haven't. We are citizens of the United States, just like you. There is fear for the safety of the men who hunt in Ohotoa Creek, especially the men who hunt on the sea ice near Ground Zero. All the way down there? Yeah, all the way down there. Well, all I can say is briefly, is that all these studies we are conducting will tell us if there is a time when this can be done safely. If we cannot find the time to do it safely, we won't do it. I hope you don't. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Once I read on a magazine about a blast unit on an Indian town. And none of you atomic people helped them. So we really don't want to say this Cape Thompson blast because this is our homeland. No, 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 of course not. The testing we have done so far has had no effect on the Indian people any place. There are no Indian people within many, many miles where we test. There are many, many Americans, or white people. Listen to us. We the people of Point Hope don't want to see this blast here. And when we say we don't want it, we mean we don't want it. discover a man who's just finished shopping at the village store. He's loading his groceries onto his Yamaha snow machine. He decides to take a Dr. Pepper out of one of the bags. Dr. Pepper. He opens the can. He finishes the Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper, nanga. He crushes. <laughs> he crushes the can. Jita. He throws the Dr. Pepper away. Dr. Pepper, uh, da. I will not. He walks back to the snow.
sewing machine to get it started. He grabs the pull cord and pulls it. It won't start. He tries again. The man is frustrated. He kicks the machine. Then he remembers. Right, the spark plug. He opens the hood of the machine and looks inside. Yep, it's the spark plug. He fixes the spark plug. You can't fix a spark plug. <laughs> Tries to start the machine once more. <laughs> yes, it starts. He closes the hood of the machine and climbs on board. Now it's time to go home. December 18th, 1971, President Richard Milhouse Nixon signs the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. The act reads, There is an immediate need for a fair and just settlement of all land claims by natives. Well, the immediate need is for the state and oil companies to build the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. No one has ever paid much attention to Alaska Natives and their claims on the land. Not when Vitus Bering named the place Ruskaya Amerika. Not when Seward bought the icebox from de Stuckel. Not even when the territory became a state in 1959. But now, there is an immediate need to drill. To drill for black gold and to build a pipeline across Alaska. This act shall be regarded as an extinguishment of all previous aboriginal title. Aboriginal comes from the Latin for from the beginning. This land, all of it, <coughs> belonged communally to the people from the beginning. That's extinguished now. Now, Alaska Native villages become corporations. Individuals become shareholders. Overnight, the trail from hunting and gathering to capitalism is widened and paved. In exchange for the land, natives are given $900 million. Ten years later, the state collects $12 billion in oil revenue. That's progress. <laughs> Thousands of 
and had to leave this. People will forget about all of this very quickly, of course, just like they'll forget about the deep water horizon explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> is soaked with oil, it loses its ability to retain air and therefore warmth. The animal dies very quickly from hypothermia. The most serious threat to anhydrolutris is oil spills. Here, in its ancestral home, Alushka, Alaska. <laughs> Casigo, you're 14 years old and you follow your uncles out of the village by snowball. There's a ground storm. You can't even see the trail or the taillights ahead of you. You're lost. You're missing. You wait in place like your elders told you to do. Then, all of a sudden, you hear popping sounds around you. It reminds you of a scary movie, The Blair Witch Project. <laughs> What's out there? Then you decide to drive again. <laughs> Back in your village, your family starts a search. They don't call the state troopers because if they did, they'd simply say, wait 24 hours, see what happens. Reason is simple, saving money. If you were lost near Anchorage, they'd send two A-star helicopters at $1,100 an hour. <laughs> but you're in the bush. They won't waste that kind of money here. If a state trooper showed up here on this ground storm, would he care for you? your family? Would he want to know your name? You're just a native. Does your life matter? Are you even a human being? driving a snow machine in late spring snow. You're following Mitchell. You're following that fox. The fox is running again, muscles working, paws barely touching snow, mouth stretched back in a long, sad smile. The fox is beautiful, red against the white snow. 
Mitchell's machine comes back over the slope. You see him charging down the ridge, Alaskan man with his knee up on the saddle of his Yamaha stallion, with a thumb on his accelerator and a finger on his trigger. He sees you sitting still, scared, not shooting the fox. You try to make up for it, zipping between the fox and the stand of willows. The fox veers away, out again into open snow. Mitchell lifts his gun while his machine is still in motion. The fox falls, red against the white snow. She keeps breathing. Next, you will pull up beside Mitchell and watch him shoot the fox twice more at point blank range. Shoot her in the head. The fox will keep on breathing. Mitchell will step on the fox's head with his white bunny boot. The fox's body will heave. With both his feet, Mitchell will compress the fox's neck into snow. You'll hear the breath wheezing out of the animal, like air out of a kinked up hose. Finally, Mitchell will say, that was tough and we'll head back to the village. On the back of Mitchell's machine, the fox will lie dripping. Red. time we met? In Castillo? Yes. Do you remember? No. I do. I was working at the school, and you were leading UROC in the school gym. You, you mean UROC? <laughs> uh, yeah, UROC. Yeah, UROC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you pick dancing. She's in, you were leading UPIC dancing in the school gym. You were drumming and singing, playing one of your songs, and everybody thought it was hilarious. They were laughing and laughing. And I wanted to talk to you, but I was too timid. I didn't want to be the white guy who tries to be friends with the lead drummer. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember seeing you around. You were always busy running, running, busy riding. <laughs> Walking real fast down the boardwalks and hallways. I wanted to talk to you, but I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to be the Eskimo guy who tries to be friends with the, with the visiting guy. I wanted, I wanted to talk to, talk to, you, to you, but, but I, I didn't know, know how. how. I'm glad I got to spend time in Casigua. It's beautiful there. Sometimes, sometimes I imagine trying to make a life in the village. I'm glad to spend some time outside of Casigua. <laughs> it's hard there. Sometimes I imagine trying to make a life somewhere else, but I'd be so far from my family. I thought you seemed happy in Casigua. I was, I am. One hundred years from now, fifty years from now, I really don't know where a loss is going. Fifty years from now. Fifty years from now. I think the sad part would be that our culture would be gone, our language is already dying, and with our kids today, you know, they want to be like any other kid who looks at technology that makes it easier for them you know, be with the times of what goes on right now today. That's the sad part, is knowing that one day this is not all going to be here, our culture. The kids are going to be so grounded in who they are and where they came from because 50 years from now the kids will have everything at their, all the history documented because their grandparents are videoing how to make a hard song, how to make a fire with friction, 
car to gather through ice for drinking water when you're out. I don't know if there'll be ice by now. <laughs> I think uh, 50 years from now, I think we'll be like, we'll, we'll be living in the life of Wall Street. If you look at the average person in New York, you won't be any different out there. You know, people with the internet and everything else, you have access to all the news instantly. This generation of kids is amazing. You know, they're smart and I've moved on to where they're ready for the future. And I think that they, they won't slow down for anything. It's completely unknowable what 50 years from now. I mean, they're saying that the polar ice may be gone. At the same time, reading back in the gold rush era, when there was dramatic change going on, Western culture arrived, Western diseases arrived, Western alcohol arrived. Somebody in the early 1900s wrote that they didn't think that native culture would survive another 20 years. And yet, look, here we are more than 100 years later, native culture has survived and in many regards is thriving. And so who's to say, I think there's massive changes ahead and I just can't predict what they're going to be or how they're going to adapt. Yeah. <laughs>